it's actually hard to block out a fight scene just sitting in your chair because you'll have this scene where somebody grabs a knife and then grabs the gun and then grabs the guy's throat and somebody's reading it and be like, how many hands does this guy have? Next plot twist. Yeah. And so, <laughs> it, and it's a fun break from just sitting in the chair, like grinding all day. You'd be like, hon, I'll meet you in the living room. You have a knife. I have the detonator and, and you sort of act out the fight scene. So. We'll kick those tires and start that fake fire. It is time to camp. Today, we welcome a very special guest, the bard of the beach, the scribe of scripts, the journalist of Jersey, a man who has predicted more chaos in the political environments than half of our news networks, a man who is a mystery and more importantly, a New York Times best-selling author, perhaps the quirkiest man we've ever had in this bus. Please welcome New York Times best-selling author, Matthew Quirk to the fire. Thanks for having me. All right, what do you think? I try to do good intros about it. We can, you know, do, I came up with those alliterations just for you. No, it's rock solid. It's like a prize fight. Him. Okay, you know? good. Just making good, sure. Good way to get into it. Okay, all right. you, you have proven eerily prescient. We'll get into this, but some of your, you know, novels is sort of uh, truth is stranger than fiction. We you should talk about it. We will. Because we talked about how long it takes a book to go from when you put it to bed to when it comes out. That's right. So even if you're prescient, you can get caught behind. That's right. No, see, that's that's a commentary on the publishing space yeah. we'll get into. But first things first, we are, of course, fake camping right now. So we need to ask some wilderness questions. You hail from New Jersey. Yes. Tell me about your relationship with nature, hiking, camping, anything. Well, we were about 10 or 15 minutes from the shore, so. <laughs> You know, our main nature thing was just we were like ocean babies and every day in the summer we would just drive down and spend all day at the beach, like body surfing, body boarding. So you're um, the original Jersey Shore. It's the Jersey Shore, I would say, is maybe not totally representative. And most of them were from other states. Um, but yeah, so just the, the ocean is my thing um, and always has been. And you know, we also sailed a lot growing up. So that was that was like the main nature thing I had growing up. And then, you know, it's nice to be in San Diego because we're just surrounded by water. That's we right. It all here. That's right. Um, okay, where's, did you do family camping trips at all? Or did you do anything um, like any natural uh, uh, national parks or anything? I don't think we ever camped. Um, so this is your first camping trip. This, no, no. I now like camp and and backpack a little bit. Um, but we would, yeah, we would mainly like get on the get on the sailboat and just kind of sail up around through the Long Island Sound and like explore that way and sleep on. Awesome. Your parents a had a camping. sailboat. Yeah, we had this old um, CNC thirty that my my dad still has. It's like forty five years old now. Um, and so we would just kind of bundle onto that in the summer, and you would go from New Jersey to Connecticut. And it would take two weeks because you'd be going about a mile and a half an hour in like the August doldrums <laughs> and you'd have three boys just rolling around beating each other up in the cabin. Uh, but it was, you know, it was really nice family time and it was it was really cool. That's great. Now, since you mentioned that Jersey Shore perhaps is not entirely representative, mm. an accurate portrayal of the state of New Jersey, what do you think we get wrong about New Jersey that you being a, a citizen of that state were able to could correct the record for us what do we get wrong about new jersey i guess the first thing is this notion that it's like an armpit you know um <laughs> armpit of america gets tossed around and it's funny because new jersey like delaware was very um industry friendly but it's all sort of concentrated along the road that people take through it so yeah north jersey and along the interstates or turnpikes is super industrial, but the state itself is, you know, the garden state. It's um, pretty affluent. It's super green. It has some of the best kind of open spaces, hmm. um, preservation in the country. And so I grew up in a, like a totally normal suburb. It was called Middletown. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there were just green everywhere. There were parks everywhere. So 
I think people miss like what a beautiful state it is. I could drive like 15 minutes and be in like horse country. Um, and I mean, the idea that people from there are, are kind of super aggressive, I don't think is, is totally off the mark, but you know, you kind of wear it with pride as a sort of like a hunger kind of thing. Now, is that a little more dormant in you since you've moved to San Diego, which is not known for being aggressive and more, you know, pacifist? Is there an inner Jersey person inside of you waiting to erupt? Well, it's nice to have, if, if you're an A-type, um, and for me, that's less along the dimension of like screaming at people or like cutting them off in traffic and just like overworking or, um, you know, being too intense. Uh, so it's nice to be in San Diego where uh, the town is so relaxed and people have such a nice work-life balance and uh, people just have fun that it's good to be immersed in that when you're natural temperament is a little bit more like driven a type because it, it brings you down a little bit while when i was in dc everybody was like that i mean new york there's a lot of that too so when that's just seen as the standard it's really hard to say like well i'm doing nothing this weekend you know when all your friends are working okay i wouldn't i I've only been a Californian, so I there's no inner aggression in me, and oh, I'm good. I'm always intimidated when I go to New York, and I realize you can totally tell Californians hailing a cab versus a non-Californian. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's really nice, and I've I've mellowed out since I've gotten out here. Okay. So I I have to ask, is it surreal? Do you would you look back and if you were talking with young little Matthew Quirk in New Jersey, mm -hmm. hey, you're going to be a New York Times best-selling author. You're going to have some of these literary giants that you, you know, looked up to, have read their stuff growing up. They're going to be peers of yours. Would you, would you pinch yourself? Would you go, this is impossible? Uh, I would, yeah, I would pinch myself. Uh, I'd be a really, I, I'm just really grateful. I, those guys aren't my peers by any means, too. You I know, said it, he of, didn't, it's okay. It was, you know, I sort of, I, I'm really fortunate with where I am, but, um, they're, they're on the next level. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. And the writing thing, you know, I've loved doing as like a passion that I've been completely enamored of since I was like 18 or 19. And you know, the question, I mean, for me, the question was like, I love writing, what can I write about that I'm good at? That was a huge question for a long time. And I had, um, wrong turns and and you, can I make a living at it that was a big challenge for me I started uh, in college as a physics major and then switched to English and thought you are throwing your life away I was you know this overly intense 18 or 19 year old so uh, the fact that I, I get to do what I love as my job and pay the bills I'm so grateful about so would you say it was was it around senior year of high school whatever you had this clarity that i want to be a writer um that is or is that something you knew you was a passion of yours that you wanted to do very early on it wasn't like a calling until i think 18 or 19 i had a summer where i came back from college i didn't have any internships or anything i was kind of working like whatever jobs and I just started writing at night and for a long time I would write at night because there's no distractions and I would just write until two, three, four in the morning and I was so into it. I would write on a, uh, on a little beach chair on the deck and uh, with a laptop and it was just like being in outer space with it and I, I just loved it and um, I wrote some stories. And I had no idea if they were any good. And I submitted them to a the fiction workshop. And I was always, I guess, kind of full of myself. So I submitted them to the advanced fiction workshop. And I got in. And uh, I couldn't believe it. And um, ever since then, I, I've loved doing it. But one thing that I learned was that sort of fiction that is taught in college and the academy that's not really my strong suit. I like reading it. And I was really fortunate to have a series of events where I 
found out that thrillers, which maybe I didn't realize or wouldn't have thought would be my strength, uh, are actually my comparative advantage. And so I I was lucky to find my way. And that all came out of journalism because the sort of subjects that I ran into in DC, which was foreign affairs and politics and all that intrigue and espionage, uh, it sort of reanimated all this stuff I used to love reading in legal thrillers or Joseph Conrad. So I had, a, I had a kind of long way around to figure out what I like to write about and what I was good at. And sometimes it's not what you think you'll be good at. So I, you mentioned this earlier. You, you sort of, you can write what you know. Is that a thing where, um, is that, is that like advice you would give to the writers? Like sort of start with write what you know. Uh, is that an easier way to sort of break in and start that process of writing? Yeah, I mean, write what you know, write what you like to read, um, write what you enjoy. For me, I was always sort of like the funny guy. And um, so when I was starting out writing fiction, kind of when I was a journalist in DC, I would read like Evelyn Waugh, which is this old British novelist. And he writes these sort of uh, satires that, that engage really powerfully with the, the politics and foreign affairs of the day. And I thought, oh, this will be my thing. And that based on sort of my personality, most people would say like, yeah, that's probably the kind of thing you'll end up writing. And they were terrible. And I couldn't figure out how to bring them in for a landing plot wise. So I started adding these more traditional thriller elements and people would read it and they'd say this, like, you know, this Georgetown um, salon scene is interminable. <laughs> uh, but then they would say, but you know, these action parts are great. And it was really funny to me because I'm not like a racing motorcycles, jumping out of airplanes guy. And but I had a certain aptitude for the thriller stuff and people responded to that. So, I mean, to answer your question, yeah, write what you know, write anything, write it through and finish it and show it to people and see if it's good or not, because you can only sort of figure it out by doing and failing many, many, many times. All right. So we're getting into your, your journey a little bit here and your story, if I may. So you, you gave up physics, and so whatever discoveries you were bound to offer to humanity. Yeah, I think humanity will be fine. With okay, so we story. don't know though, right? <laughs> yeah. In fact, if you had been the physicist who discovered the other particle, it would have been called the quark particle and not quark. The, oh God, when we talked about the quarks, it was, it was always a good time in, in physics seminar, yeah. <laughs> I just, somewhere out there, somewhere out there's a physics group that appreciates that humor that we just yeah. did. That's good. So. You give up physics, you go into writing, and then you, you're writing, you're enjoying it, and then um, you actually, you took a little bit of a detour, right? You ended up in journalism prior mm -hmm. to that. So you worked, worked at The Atlantic. Yeah. So tell us about that and how that prepped you for what would happen later. Well, there was the subject matter. So I had been, I'd been much more sort of like a literary, artsy, humanities guy in college. And then I went to DC and uh, I mean, even I, I majored in history and literature, but the history stopped in like 1945. And I wasn't one of these debate kids. I didn't really uh, know a lot about contemporary foreign affairs and politics, certainly not, not at the level that people in DC know, where it's just they've been breathing it since they were like 12 years old. And then I was at the Atlantic, and it's this perch where you're just can kind of weighed into all of it. And I had these sort of wild experiences where I was really fortunate that a new owner had come in and I worked sort of pretty closely with him and he would invite me and some of the other young staffers to, he would have Georgetown salons, you know, this like old school thing you only think you're going to read about in like, you know, some 1960s, uh, story about like you know the kennedy the camelot and 
he would have me over and, you know, I was sitting there, I was 18 or 19. I had no idea what was going on. It was the run up to the Iraq war. Um, oh, so I would have been like 22 or 23. This was like right after college. And I was an intern between junior and senior year. And it was like a former CIA director, uh, a guy who later became the national correspondent or uh, a columnist for the New York Times and then the national correspondent for the Atlantic. And they're debating whether uh, America should become an imperial power again. And I was just like, this is really where people decide this kind of thing. And, and I was just so lucky to have to be able to be a fly on that wall. And I also needed to, to cram, to just catch up and get the know-how to be able to, you know, have some fluency with the, the politics and the foreign affairs. And at the same time, you know, there are like, there are spies and there's foreign intrigue and it's around everywhere in DC and you run into it and it's incredibly cool. Um, so that all gave me the subject matter expertise. Um, expertise is a strong word, like familiarity and fired my imagination. Oh, this is the stuff I should be writing about. Um, you know, thrillers. And at the same time, the magazine forced a lot of writing habits on me in a way I don't think I ever could have appreciated if I were just doing it on my own. And, and namely, it rejected like 90% of what I proposed. And to this day, it's very similar when I used to go to an editor, because I was a young guy there, and The Atlantic doesn't need, didn't need articles from me. They're like, oh, we bumped your piece because Salman Rushdie wanted to write something. I'm like, please, yeah. Uh, so I would come to him with, with 20 ideas and maybe one would be okay. And I, now when I'm writing a book, I'll sit down and I'll have this Evernote file and I'll have 20 ideas. And I try to use that same discipline just with myself and say, no, this is the clean concept. This will give a nice, like clean story. So it was in those two areas that really helped. All right, so you're forced to meet deadlines. You're coming up with stories constantly. Sounds like great training ground for future novelists. And then uh, what happened at Atlantic and how did you get forced into writing or how'd you get pushed into writing professionally from that uh, as well, a novelist? Yeah, pushed and forced are apt uh, because I was working on these novels forever. It was really one novel when I talk about trying these different genres, it was one book. And I would get to the end and say, oh, maybe I'm good at this. And then I would start at the beginning. So there was this endless six year cycle of reworking this one manuscript. And I went and sent it to a friend because I was, I was getting busier at the Atlantic. They sort of reworked the opening section of the magazine and I was getting more sort of not really like dispatch kind of articles for there. And that was really neat. And so I was getting busy with that. And I said, I just need to see if this is decent at all. So I sent it to a friend who worked at Harper's, uh, a young woman. And I thought she would show it to another kind of young person who was a literary agent. I knew she knew uh, one or two. And, and I thought nothing of it. And then it was 2008 and the economy imploded. And the first thing to go is advertising and then media. So just they started laying people off left and right. And I got laid off. And then three days later, I get an email from the young agent she sent it to. And he said, you know, I work with um, with David Gurner, who is, is John Grisham's agent. And, uh, you know, we read this. It was like the opening chunk of the book. And we think it's good and you should keep going. It was something like that. And I had never had professional feedback on writing. Wow. And it was one of these ways where you get just what you need just on time because that gave me the confidence and knowing that I had some chops, I gave myself permission to you know, pursue it professionally. I had some money socked away and I, I just did it for two years. So you were, you wrote without other income for two years? Yeah. And ate spaghetti. Were you married at the time? No, I was, by the end of it, I was engaged. Okay. So, 
it was funny because this sort of, I'm going to blow everything off and live my dream, I probably wouldn't have done if I hadn't been kind of forced off the ledge a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was great because, and it was still rough because that book turned out to not be great. And then I wrote another book and uh, found a different agent who was terrific. And that book turned into the 500. And I, I had broken my knee too, just for extra pathos. So I was like, kind of running on funds. I was about to get married, which was my personal deadline to stop this like writing dream. Oh, okay, forever. So, so you leave the you, you've bumped Atlantic. You say, look, I've got this encouragement. John Grisham's agent says, hey, you got some good stuff. here. I'm going to give myself at the time. Did you say I'm going to give myself two years or was it just like I'm going to pursue this? And then once things started solidifying with your relationship, you're like, OK, I think. No, my wife was the most supportive person and to this day and was amazing. And um, so I, yeah, I, I was always very frugal. So I had some money socked away and then there wasn't much of a deadline. And then I connected with the agent and he and I hashed out some stuff, uh, the second agent. And that was a funny moment because I had applied for MFA programs mm -hmm. where like you can, make a living writing, but you make like $14,000 a year or something. Um, and I had to decide whether to write this book concept I'd come up with, with the agent or go to this funded MFA I'd gotten into. And it was one of these like, life moments from a rom-com kind of thing. Cause I would, they called and I was riding my bicycle through Georgetown and I said, no, I'm going to take a flyer on writing this book. And then that book came together in nine months. It was the 500 and we sold it to Little Brown and then we sold the film rights all on the same weekend and it like completely changed my life. Um, and it all came together about a month before my wedding, which that had been one of the, just based on my personality, sort of self-imposed deadlines of when I was going to try to get another media job. The landscape was pretty rough then and go back to, I wouldn't quit writing, but I would probably go back to doing it on the side nights and weekends. But yeah, it all came together kind of a month before this deadline. And then I got this dream deal with the little Brown and Fox and yeah, it was a very happy wedding. Wow. And you got this woman to say yes to marrying you when all you were able to say is I'm working on that novel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, she wasn't chasing me, you know, because of the spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> yeah, no, it was that's wonderful. Like, that's and a good she woman was, right there. That's good. She was more supportive uh, or like more believed in it. Absolutely. She probably believed in me more strongly than I believed in myself and just said, go for it. So you mentioned that the book you garnered praise from Grisham's agent on ended up you didn't even you abandoned that book entirely. Yeah. And went to another book. So how do you deal with as a writer you've got ideas you know some of potential and the only way to flesh them out or the only way to see how viable they are is to flesh them out and get going how often though do you find yourself in that situation where you get a certain ways down the road and you go you know what um i'm not passionate about this one anymore um or this isn't working you know, walk us a little through your process for because that seems to be the big risk yeah in writing is that you spend all this time and then Either you don't finish it or you it doesn't it, you're going to find out it doesn't work. Yeah. And I mean, the, the shocking thing is the degree to which sometimes these books, you only know it if you see it when it's done. And this drove me crazy at the beginning because coming from journalism, I would go to my editor and be like, here's the thing. And it would be like what you would think of as kind of a log line in, in TV or film. You know, it would just be a premise. And he could tell me if that would work or not. And then I had this book. Agents were interested in it, but ultimately didn't like it. And they all said, take another couple of years, write another book, and we'll let you know if it's good or not. And I said, can I tell you what it's about? Because sometimes you'll be like, it's about librarians, and they'll be like, great. And you'll be like, and they're all witches. And they'll be like, no witches. Witches aren't good anyway. And so, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Like, you just want to tell them the premise and they'll let you know. And that's how it worked in journalism. But it was crazy to me that you had to write the book to find out if it was even, 
if even the premise was worth pursuing. And that's why I really got along with my first agent was he was a, uh, he could kind of tell you up and down on the premise and the premise for the 500 really like carried everything. And so it, it's, it's shocking how much to this day, I will write an entire book and hand it in and the editor will say, eh, it doesn't quite work. And I've, I've like, I write synopses and sometimes it doesn't work, you know? Um, Wait, so you, you'll still write books to this day that get, no, say not going to work. Yeah. And then you have to rewrite it really fast. What do you mean really fast? Like three months, like a whole new book. Oh, so this is like, you've been, you have a deal to do a book, right? Yeah. And then they'll say, you know, thank you, but not, not what we need. It's not like something, I mean, hopefully you can rework it and not have to write a whole new book. But the last, this book, I completely rewrote in three months and, and almost died doing it. But yeah, it, it happens. And, um, so sometimes you just need to write your way through it and then see if it's any good. That said, I try to do a, I don't really play a lot of tennis, but, um, T. Jefferson Parker, a great local author, he said, you know, you got to play percentage tennis on these things, which really stuck with me. I try to safeguard against that. And the, and the first step, and this is part of the advice I tell writers is, you know, start with the premise, like I was talking about in journalism. And then, you know, you have five ideas for a book and then just tell it to people, you know, and see if they are interested because we all get so obsessed with kind of the topic we're working on and you're so inside the project. It's, it's really surprising how sometimes you'll just tell it to people and they'll be like, Oh, okay. It's about a cowboy. Yeah. And then you'll say some other part of it and they'll be like, well, that doesn't make sense. And you've just been thinking about this thing by yourself for like months and that might never occur to you. So I encourage people to, you know, have their ideas and, and then just tell them to friends and family and then see what they say and see if they're like, Oh yeah. Interesting. Tell me more. And if they're like, Oh, okay. So, I mean, typically the problem is that it's like a thinly veiled, veiled version of you doing slightly cooler things without like a real plot. You're just like kind of walking around being cool, you know? Um, and, and the other piece is like, it should be a premise, you know, like a, like that you can see that that's going to be a book. You know, um, do people fly? How do you ensure you get candid feedback? Because I feel like if I told my parents of the premise, they'd go, That's great. And if I told them, they'd go, That one's good too. Yeah. And I'm like, No, tell me if this sucks. Like, I need to know. You want to have a, um, a ladder of increasing meanness. Okay. Which I can do in my family, like starting with my mom, who's, I mean, now I'm a professional at this, so they're, they're pretty candid. And then I go to my brother, Mike, the hammer. You know, and, and and he'll tell it like it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they'll all tell it like it is at this point. And you also need to calibrate readers over time, which I'm fortunate to have the time to do. So my dad will not say something direct. He'll be like, yeah, yeah, and then the girl, that was interesting, you know? And you have to draw it out of him. But when he finally says it, it's incredibly frank and, and brutal. So. so essentially, there is no way to fully mitigate the risk that you could spend vast sums of time on a piece of work that ultimately you or your uh, or the recipient will not like and and won't work at all and and you've spent all your time and opportunity cost to make money doing something else doing that and that's just the joy of writing you can almost like count on a book not working like you'd expect and and the way to deal with that is to give yourself plenty of time and to think about writing as rewriting and to build in like iterations. So if I have a year to write a book, I'll write a super rough draft in four months and then reread it myself and see if it works. And then there were things that I thought would work that don't. And so you're just completely reworking it. And then I'll give it to some early readers and, you know, hopefully along the way you're getting consensus. So by the time you like bring it to your editor, who's super busy, and you give it to them and it, you know, it needs to be in pretty good shape to publish so you don't throw off the schedule. 
by then you've you know you figured it out um so yeah you think of writing as rewriting i write a super rough draft which is just the best because you take off the perfectionist impulses uh and then it's much easier to throw out big sections if you haven't labored over perfecting the language to a high polish and you know you can get it done quickly and see if it works in in sort of a rough form but you know the the analogies are really like building furniture or building a house where you know you're just going to rough it out and it's going to be ugly and there's going to be like splinters everywhere and then you know, you go through everything again and you sheetrock it and then you paint it and like you don't make it nice until everything works, you know, and and the final layers are like sanding. I don't know. Have you done a lot of sanding? It's like I have not sanded it takes, a lot. It's like what well, is this? 80 grit is, so if I grit. if I have Michael Connolly or Vince Flynn or any of these other, you know, amazing writers, are they all going to say the same thing? Is this sort of an accepted thing that everyone's got a different process? But is it? This sanding, this grinding, like it's just, it's just difficult. There's just no way around it. I think so. I mean, uh, no, Lee Child will say, and he's amazing, will say he writes, he takes four months. He starts the same day every year. I mean, he's, he's retired now. Um, he starts on like September 1st. He finishes on January 30th or whatever it is. And he gets to the end. He hits a period. It's done. And it's hard for me to believe that's true, but he's, I haven't read it. He had somebody ride along with him writing a book. They wrote a book about him writing a book. That's very mad. That's how he does it. Um, but yeah, most people will say writing is rewriting and I'm actually much more of an outliner or planner. So I spent a lot of time reworking and shaping in the outline phase. But a lot of people just dive in on page one and find the story while they're writing it. Uh, like huge, huge authors do this. Authors whose books like are, are a big part of the budget of publishing company. They're just diving in and hoping it all works. And it's, uh, it's such a crazy head game. Um, so I actually have less of a mystery when I dive in because I know where everything's going because I'm an outliner, but there's a lot of people just dive in at one end and they do even more reworking and rewriting because they've sort of figured out the story by the time they get to the end. Hmm. How do you know if you have what it takes to be a writer? Well, so you have to want to write, which sounds kind of obvious, but it's, it's tough. And a lot of people don't actually want to sit down to write. And, and writing is one of these things where... I don't know. It's like it's like buying a Porsche, maybe, or a boat, or something. Where I'll tell people like, "Do you have a lot of experience in this?" No. Okay. <laughs> because I'm I'm sensible. I say, "Don't do it, don't do it." And if somebody has to do it to like feel okay, if they would do it regardless of whether it miserates them, then I'm like, "Okay, go do it." So you really just have to do it. And, and the, the crazy thing is actually sitting down to write even for, I think with, there are exceptions, but most even professional writers, the actual sitting down to write has a lot of head games in there. And a lot of what, uh, Stephen Pressfield, who I mentioned, you know, when we were talking earlier, uh, calls resistance. Um, so you have to really be interested in just, sitting down and writing and being by yourself in a room and being kind of fussy about interruptions um, for, for hours 
a day for weeks on end. And it's it's kind of a tough gig. So I I, I recommend it to people who are, are so passionate about it that they would they would expire if they weren't allowed to write. And I was I was kind of that way. Sounds like you also need to be comfortable with spaghetti as well. Yeah, uh, there might be a couple of years where you're eating spaghetti. Yeah. I mean, let me drill, drill down on that a little further. Where are there certain traits that you see in the best writers that I've always wondered, is there a certain, like, and even intelligence quotient they have to have? Do you find that writers who are successful, a lot of them tend to be either brilliant or is it a, they have an economy of words or they just happen to know, you know, know the English language very well? I'm just curious if there are things that would mm. point towards, you know what, that actually makes a, a great a great writer or would actually help like a natural attributes that would maybe point towards potential for success no i think it's just like a passion for reading and writing and so reading is important too oh my god yes so how does that you mentioned in one of your other interviews that it, you have to read a thousand books to write one good book yeah you just have to you have to read a ton of them to sort of know the genre genre is so important um because you know your readers read a lot of books and it, you just have to be in, invested in this world and excited about it. And that way you also learn stories at a sort of instinctual way of how they should go. Because you can read like formulas of how to structure a story, but you, you sort of have to know it in your bones. And also you have to know the genre well enough to know where you can fiddle with it to surprise people, which is important, but where you things you can't sort of break the promise. So do you all read each other? So like, you know, cause I noticed the forwards of your book, you've got some great authors. You talked about Michael Connelly earlier. Do you read all these writers uh, work as part of your job? Would you say like you read thriller yeah. novels? Yeah. All the yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I read a lot of thriller novels for fun and for craft. I read a lot of nonfiction too, but yeah, it's really important. And then you just you read it and you're thinking, oh, he's going this way. And then he doesn't go that way. And then you're reading it and like, oh, she's setting up that this person's. And then I get a lot of good ideas from misapprehending where people's red herrings are going. And I think, oh, that's cool. I'll do that. Um, and then I mean, to go back to your earlier question in terms of like smarts and or in vocabulary, that's not really it. And And I actually sometimes kind of hyper brilliant people get so up in their own heads that I think they can have a hard time writing. And um, mm, that must be my issue. Yeah, you're too, you're too brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've been looking for that for yeah. a while. There, oh, so. I'm sorry to report that you're just too smart for this. Yeah, yeah. so it's just th there's a sort of stubbornness and um, and then You, you need to, and this is a really hard thing because people who, who read and write a lot, they sort of put literature or fiction on a pedestal where it should be, but there's like a preciousness about writing or a stage fright. And I had this when I first went to the magazine, I was like, I'm going to write something that you're going to print and mail to a million people. I'm so nervous about this. And then you just get used to that sort of by exposure to it. Um, so, and, and, but every day, I think a lot of writers have kind of a struggle of, you know, perfectionism and stuff like that. So the people who just think about it as a job and who get the words on the page, not to take away any of the specialness from it, but that, that outlook I think is really important because it's really easy to get into your own head and, um, yeah, half of, half of the half of the game is just psychology and, and discipline really. Now, I know you take research very seriously. I've no, you've been known to pick a lock or two and you even dabbled in urban escape courses. I would like to know a little bit more about the ends you go to, to bring us these thrillers. Well, yeah. What's funny when you're the research guy and somebody comes to you with a, an opportunity, you have to then take it of so course. you can get yourself into a sticky situation. So I had all these sort of lock picking, physical security, break in expert guys I would talk to. And, 
you know, they read the books and they said, with all this running and escaping from people, you should really take this uh, urban escape and evasion course. And it was run by this um, kind of security expert. They train a lot of military and go to L.A. I signed up for it and did it. And you get like three days of lessons in L.A. and like how to break out of handcuffs, how to, you know, um, how to get away from people chasing you, improvise weapons. And then the final day, they kidnap you. They throw you in the back of a van. They put a hood over your head. And they handcuff your hands behind your back. And then, like, for added effect, they, they stun gun you. <laughs> Which is a practical thing, because the idea is, you know, can you pick the locks while you're terrified? You know it's coming when they're going to, or they not, they say like at some point you'll be kidnapped. Well, we know there's a field exercise on the last day, but you don't know you're going to get thrown into the back of a car. We kind of do. Okay. So you show up, you show up. No, it's not like you're at the hotel and then they're like, oh. um, <laughs> so yeah, but, and there's a practical reason. Like when you're scared, you're, you're fine motor skilled this right. way. So, the, and then you have to pick your way out and then run and, um, and then you have to run across LA and they have these trackers trying to follow you. And if they catch you, they handcuff you to a like parking meter, whatever's handy. And then you have to catch items to pick the handcuffs. And fortunately, I wasn't caught. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a really interesting exercise just to learn and to get all the technical details, but also to like scare the dickens out of myself. And because, it, you know, I'm writing these books in a comfy chair in San Diego. So it's good every once in a while to kind of throw myself into one of those terrifying scenarios. So were we to kidnap you now, you could escape? I, I could probably do OK. I don't have, uh, you know, the normal hairpins taped to, you know, discreet places on my body, which you do for the last day of this course. Got it. Okay. But um but I could, yeah, we learned some tricks. Well, like all deep chats, uh, it makes me very hungry. And we are fake camping, and so I would love to hear from a writer of your clout and stature, what is your perfect s'more? I gave this a lot of thought, and my I'm gonna give two answers really. If you're going traditional s'more, the thing that not really to make it delicious, but just because the sense memory of it is so strong, is to completely incinerate the marshmallow, hmm. so it's just like black and boiling, and then it kind of turns into napalm. Okay. So that's just such a classic. But I thought about this and. If I had to do whatever gourmet, there's no limits, s'more, I think I would go, not even technically a s'more, I would go two chocolate chips, chocolate chip cookies that I would sort of heat. I'd have to find a way to balance them on a fork or something. We can figure this out. Until yeah. they're nice and gooey. And then this isn't even realistic camping. Some vanilla ice cream or some Americone dream in the middle for an ice cream sandwich by the campfire and maybe roll the edges in crushed peanut butter cups that's what i came up with well i know you gave up physics so we don't know exactly how to make this happen but it's possible where there's a will and you're right yeah, we'll I figure out a story it. where yeah. this works we might have to fudge it it's like that was good that was good oh i didn't even think of that oh that wasn't a pun no 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 oh. Yeah. See, way to but go. Suspending disbelief. That's what we do. That's right. There's uh it's like Diddy Reese did these ice cream sandwiches up by UCLA, um, and they're fantastic. Uh, where they just take you pick two warm cookies and you yes. put a thing of ice cream between it. The best. Yeah, we better finish this interview because that sounds really good right now. Now we ask everyone to share a very spooky story with us, and as an author of many short stories, I'm sure that you have plenty that you could tell us about that is a little mm -hmm. spooky, especially focusing on 
foreign intrigue and espionage. You must have encountered a lot of scary things in your time at the Atlantic, and I'd love to hear a spooky story if you have one for us. Oh, I'm trying to think of if I have anything off the top of my head in DC. Oh, it doesn't have to be DC. We yeah, could do. Yeah. You mentioned you had a an experience. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about this and it, it is sort of literary themed because I was a huge Stephen King fan when I was an adolescent and and to this day. And I would stay up until all hours. I was always sort of nocturnal reading Pet Cemetery, It, Christine, Cujo, The Dark Half, and just scaring myself silly. <laughs> And I would, I would read these 1,200 page books because I couldn't stop, because I couldn't turn off the light, because I would just be so terrified. And it was one of those nights, I was maybe 12, and I grew up in this, this part of this suburban town that was kind of the historic part. It had like the 18th, 19th century cemeteries and churches. And we went to this really cool church which had an old white wood chapel where like Blackbeard had gone before he was hanged, according to local lore. And Blackbeard's they, local church? Yeah, because the pirates were all operating out of New Jersey. And so hmm. there were two 18th century churches right behind my house on this hill. And I was the only person in my family with a room on the back of the house. And so you'd read Pet Cemetery. And then you, you know, turn off the lights and you look out the window and it was up on a hill and you could just see the trees hanging over the old cemetery. And I would just be absolutely terrified because I knew however it worked when the demons or whatever was coming out of the cemetery was going to come for me first. And I was all alone in the back of the house. And it was one of those nights I had like put down the Stephen King and, uh, and I was sitting there trying to go to bed. And then I just hear doof against the wall. I'm, my bed was right against the wall. I hear doof and then like tss, 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 like claws on the roof. I was on a second story and there was a roof. Like if you went out my bedroom window, you'd be on top of a roof and then you would drop another story. And I said, oh, that must have, I must be hearing things. That must have been, I don't know. And then I hear it again, doof. And then tss, 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 and I start to freak out because there's no denying that this is a real thing that's happening. And it sounds like somebody pounding on the wall and claws on these asphalt tiles. And I just try to hope it'll go away. And it happens again, you know? And then finally I get up, I must've grabbed something. You know how this happens and you have like some ridiculous weapon. You have like a silicone spatula, like you're going to defend yourself with it. I don't know what I have. <laughs> And I go to the window. I think I was probably wearing like tidy whities and with just, you know, a skinny 12 year old. And I look and I see two figures in the backyard. Um, and it, it was two friends of mine, Jamie and Elaine. They had sneaked out of their house. They would do sleepovers and they were throwing to get my attention. I guess there weren't pebbles in the backyard. I, we had this real fun kind of adolescent friendship with them and we would sneak out to each other's houses during sleep sleepovers and throw pebbles and then sneak out of houses and like go to the playground in the middle of the night and stuff. And it was these two friends of mine. So it wasn't something from another dimension or anything like that. Well, it was we, scary. If we rewrite this too, they come inside and you're all laughing and then you hear the doom. And then you're like, but you guys are inside now. Right. So we could make it. Oh yeah. 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 That's a free short story. Any of, I mean, so many of these like spooky stories are about like are about like teen you know excitement and you know so it would be it would make for a good ghost story if you're reading it at night by yourself yeah i mean you're asking for it i know demonic clowns then in, in, at least they're in maine i was in san diego reading it and i was like you know that was up in maine so at least the clown yeah, was far safe i felt somewhat safe yeah. but although he's an interdimensional clown i think he could get here and so he could find ways to get yeah. there that's my issue Stephen King, that guy writes so much. I mean, just, mm -hmm. and his books are all 1,200 pages. They're, they're, they're so, a well, lot of them, they're huge. I mean, nowadays they're sort of a normal 
length, you know, they're like three or four hundred, and I mean, he can do it all. He can do literary, he can do hard boiled crime, he can do the sort of classic supernatural stuff. The guy's, yeah, this Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, and, yeah just yeah. this like heartfelt stuff. The guy's a spooky genius. He's just been channeling our deepest fears for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. That probably comes at a cost, too. Well, he, I mean, he's an interesting guy. He had, um, I think he's sober now, but he had he had substance stuff going on, which he writes about, um, which kind of comes through in the books. So like the dark half is very much like this person taking possession of me, writing. So I mean, he's a fascinating guy, and and to have a career like that is is absolutely incredible. And he, as I understand it, does an outline. And to be able to write a twelve hundred page book that people can't stop reading just by the seat of your pants is totally incredible and speaks to how well he just knows what what fascinates and enchants people so he's he's next level man well stephen king i know you're watching put down that pen for just a second or the keyboard and come join us by the fire That'd open invi fun. open invitation so I we'll have matthew back too i wouldn't so. want to hear his, his ghost story though Stephen King's ghost story, that would be the most viral segment the show's I've ever read done. read them all, yeah. That would have been, or yeah, I watch it's like super fluffy and positive because yeah, he used yeah. up everything. So I want to do a little bit of an experiment, sort of quasi lightning round, where we're going to take a, a hypothetical aspiring writer. Mm -hmm. Someone who says, you know, let's just take, I'm going to make up a composite character here, right? So like a, a six foot four, like modestly handsome, you know, somewhat quick witted San Diego resident who travels around in like a, a mobile bus with a campfire interviewing, you know, prominent people who then just says, you know what? I'm tired of making YouTube videos. Writing is where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And I want to adapt a universe based off my mobile camping adventures. And I want to, and this person, whoever it is, would like to be a New York Times best-selling fiction author. Mm -hmm. So can, let's, can we walk through the steps of how that happens? How does one become a New York Times best-selling fiction author? Like, from the very beginning, what do you, what do we what does this person need to start? Well, you don't want to start with a goal that big because you'll just paralyze yourself. <laughs> and I've, I've, this composite character does experience that. Yeah, I'm guessing. And set yourself up for for like failure or you know you would you would do really well and you'd be like, but I never made the list, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I would I would dial it down. Okay. And um, so, low, first step: lower expectations. Lower. Well, take it easy on yourself. Okay. You know, have fun with it, and then I would, I would ask them what my my first step, honestly, would be to encourage them to only like throw away their lives to do this to if they're gonna spend all their time doing this if they're completely committed and super passionate about it and they've been like they can't help it that's kind of the first thing so does it take that though do you have to stop doing everything or no. can you you can do this on the side yeah i did it nights and weekends okay you know so you totally can and a lot of people do but they're committed there's a lot of attorneys who become really good thriller writers and they would get up at like four in the morning and then write from four to six thirty, and then go work a twelve-hour or ten-hour day at a firm. Yeah, you know, um, uh, Steve Barry. Um, and, wow. and is that Joe why Anderson. lawyers are so unhappy? Well, they're writing the thrillers, I think, because they're unhappy, <laughs> and they want to go elsewhere. So, you know, make sure you're committed, and then, you know, ask them if they have any ideas. And uh, so, an idea would be helpful. Yeah, and then and then try to make sure the idea would work. Um, and, you know, I sort of work off this sort of funnel of I'll have a hundred ideas, but, and I'll think, oh, when am I ever going to have time to write all these books? But then when I sit down to write the next book, you find all these things wrong with these ideas. And now I have the experience to know, like, that's a landmine that you're going to be eight months into and realize like, that's totally intractable and you're screwed. Um, so you try to winnow down the ideas to something where you say, oh, that's actually, that's really interesting, you know, and you can do that with your friends and family. Like most people who watch a lot of TV or read a lot of books, they'll have a, like a story sense 
and say, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know. Hmm. Um, how do you get so? Um, how do you get your ideas? And what's your process from just, do you sit and brainstorm? Do you walk around? How do you start, would you say to, well, again, we'll call our composite character Brian for arguments. Sake. Okay. Brian wants to know how to, how, to, how to get ideas for even a book in general. Just, yeah, how do you do it? Do you walk, how do you, how do you conjure up a hundred book ideas? Yeah, so they just come to you all the time. And then, I mean, mine come from like reading the newspaper or watching other books and movies and then you know you'll you'll watch a movie like uh i can't even think i once did the ending of a thriller based on the old 80s comedy uh trading places oh cool because it had a really brilliant kind of flim flam at the end and i thought oh i can do that in a serious thriller and then it turns out they got that from like an 18th century operetta or something. So um, I they just come to you all the time. So I encourage people to write them down. I use Evernote and I just tag it with book idea. And then when I have to write a book, I pull those all up. And the thing that, you know, as you were falling asleep, you're like, a book about gorillas, but they play chess, whatever it is, you know, you'll That's think good. of the most random thing. Yeah. Um, you, you and then you look at it and you're like, that wouldn't work. I had an idea for a book where a guy is friends with a CIA guy and actually helps him by letting him use his company as cover. And then the CIA guy gets killed. And then the civilian dude ha has to take over his cover to pretend to be him to find out what happens. And you know, and I've been doing this for 10 years now. I mean, like 18, if you count the before I was published, I thought this was so awesome. And I was totally committed to it. And I couldn't make it work. It was it didn't work. And I, I kind of fortunately figured it out at the outline phase instead of having one of these situations where you're like 300 pages in. Um, but it's just I would encourage somebody getting into this to try to think through the whole idea. And um, I, I would encourage them to do some some story structure homework. Like most of this comes from screenwriting, um, and it's like Sid Field and Robert McKee and Save the Cat. Um, they're really good to just articulate the things that we all sort of know about how stories work from growing up around watching TV and movies and books, and. Yeah, and then have them winnow down, and then I would encourage them to outline it, um, and then to to write it, and to write it quickly, uh, just to see if it works. And and I would encourage them to be take it really easy on themselves to just get the story down, really, uh, because. I think when you're starting out writing, the most difficult thing is the perfectionism and the blank page. So if you tell yourself, I'm going to write the super rough first draft, you know, you, you take the pressure off yourself. And I just write the whole thing super rough. And then once you have it down psychologically, it's just such a relief and you can fix it. You can always fix it. So that's another crucial step for them. And yeah, and then I would have them reread it. And if it kind of works for them and have them polish it and then show it to people, I would, I would have them tell, talk through the story with people too, because it's like very easy to get into your own head and miss things. So let, let's take this gorilla chess playing thriller. We'll call I it really wish I'd come the up with Queen's, a better... The Queen's Kong or how about King Pawn? You know? Okay, yeah. We could go with that. I really wish I had come up with a better example. This, I, I'm going to roll with this. Okay. I like it. So Brian, this guy, Brian, likes it. So starts right now. How do you actually flesh out? How do you know if an idea is viable? Do you sit there and think through, okay, this is what's going to happen in each chapter? Or how do, you, how do you know if an idea is going to work or not? Well, this, I mean, the, the screenwriters have, have formalized and talked through this stuff a lot more than, I think, novelists. And so at its most basic level, it's can you see that story from beginning to end? And there are some other 
And that's really your work for the next, I mean, it should take a month. Like, are you sitting there thinking about this? Like, okay, so the gorilla, it's where Planet of the Apes leaves off. One of the monkeys is really good at chess and the remnants of humanity and he challenges it. Like, do you sit there and just kind of talk it through in your head or do you write it out? Yeah, and then I'll, I'll write it out on, um, I use a program called Scrivener, which is basically like index cards on a computer. And um, yeah, I'll go through the whole thing. And I guess the most intuitive way to do it is just sit down. Can you see that being a story? And the thing I would always run into is that I would have um, like a premise, but not a plot. So mm. it would be something where, and, and I think maybe this was like journalism training coming through. I would say, you know, what if um, there was a secret government program that was using prisoners to, um, you know, run illegal mines in South Africa or something, you know? And, and But that's not really like a story. A story is, that's that's like the premise, that's the conspiracy, but the story is, oh, someone killed my brother I need to get revenge. Someone took my daughter. I need to get her back. Someone's trying to kill me. I need to survive. Like, if I don't get to Florida in eight hours, this bomb will go off. The thing, and it's different for every person, I had to learn how to make sure every story had a sort of visceral, clean plot in terms of what kicks it off and how it's gonna end. And this this comes out of the screenwriting stuff. So you need to make sure your book has a sort of inciting incident that that sets everything up. And if it's if it's well done and well constructed, that will suggest an ending. And so a book will have um, you know, if it starts with a murder, it's gonna end with justice being achieved or not achieved or finding the killer or finding out what happened. So this is why genre is so important. Um, and if it's a kidnapping, it will end with the resolution of that kidnapping. So somebody might, you know, want to write about, um, you know, a Kurdish translator coming back to America and bear in mind, these are all commercial fiction genre stuff that I'm doing. I would say, well, okay, that's, that's cool. Um, but what's what's the story is like somebody coming for him is so you, you have to find the actual plot and story mm. and the premise that that understanding those distinctions were was like an important thing I learned as I as I came through it. OK, so a practical step would be OK. I've got my premise. I've got gor gorillas playing chess. I'm going to actually map this out on index cards and see if I can get to checkmate. You know. Yeah, or, or even just, you know, in a big Word document or a legal yeah. pad. You know, how does it start? How does it end? Um, and then run that by someone and say, hey, how do you feel about a story that does? Yeah, say, hey, I'm going to buy you, like, a really nice coffee, and then I'm just going to, like, jaw at you for 20 minutes about yeah. how I think the story goes. And when you say these things out loud, you know, halfway through, you'll be like, oh, and then you think the president's dead, but the president's driving the tank. People are like, the, the president's driving the tank? That seems that seems like a lot. And you might even realize it yourself when you articulate it. So for me... Like, well, no, I. but, you know, I mean, oh, no, you thought that. Well, guess what? You think it's the president in the tank, okay. but it's not. The chess playing gorilla. That's right. It. It's a yeah. gorilla yeah. who was playing chess. And these... <laughs> and just articulating it, it gets you out of your own head, and it gets you talking to people, um, which is really important. And so my writing advice and, and writing process, a lot of it works against just being by yourself in front of a computer. So when it comes to like nuts and bolts, how do I, what do I do with my day? Um, you have to break it up into like really small chunks, you know? So. You just need to outline the story. So you just need to get it down to, yeah, is this is this a kidnapping story? Is it a is it a, you know, stopping an attack story? Is it 
escaping somebody trying to kill you, you know, you get it down to that level. And, um, but, but day to day, I figure this all out while taking a walk or while talking to a friend of mine or a family member. And it's just so much more fun than staring at the computer. And I figure out what I'm going to write if it's, if, if it's the synopsis or if it's an actual scene for the book while wandering around my neighborhood. And then I sit down and write it. So I'm a huge advocate of getting away from your computer, figuring out what you're going to say, and then sitting down just to sort of record it. Or while I'm walking around, I'll make a voice note of what I'm going to say. Got it. Yeah. So there are, now in some elements, I might have an idea that I uh, understand already and have a, a wonderful knowledge base of. But in the example of Brian's guerrilla chess thriller, uh, they may not know anything about gorillas or chess. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some research, right, that has to happen, right? Yeah. And uh, you actually have some great research stories too, right? Because you're pretty methodical in your research, right? Yeah. I try. I mean, so you want to... Research is tricky because in some ways it can be a, per, a procrastination thing. Mm. And it can, like, sometimes mess with your the resistance in writing a book. Like, I have to figure everything out. So you want to make sure you do enough research that you know the premise will work. And then when you're in these creative moments kind of get away from the research so you don't you know you don't want to do a story it's hard for me to think of an example you know where like a cia person is doing something in the united states and you get and it's really authentic feeling and then you you know you get nine months into it and you know somebody says you know the agency doesn't operate inside the u.s and you're like oh man i didn't so you want to check those things first <laughs> and then when i'm actually writing um I like turn off the internet completely and it's when I do that I write twice as much a day and is the phone in the room or is the phone gone the phone's gone um, I use an app called I had to buy an app that would turn off my internet called freedom and I bought it and I thought of myself as like a person a willful person in charge of myself and I bought it and I went from you know working hard to write 1,000, 1,200 words a day to easily writing 1,800 words a day. Wow. And I was like, I have been putzing around on the internet way too much. It's So the internet distraction is a huge thing. Um, but, you know, and then and then the research, it is really fun, and it's, it's important to get the details right, but it also kind of inspires uh, future stories so I can you know get into some of the fun research there. I sort of went in a different direction from your question no, but I would is, love to get into them. Too. No this is great I would actually I do want to because you have some amazing research stories but uh, or what actually I want to come back to this because you have some fun ones about uh, kidnapping in particular uh, that I'd love to come back to but so you've unpl if if our hypothetical writer has now blocked the internet they're writing it's day in day out uh, they're getting stuff done uh, why I know it's different for everybody. You mentioned the child's taking a few months. Others, you write, you tend to, you write a book a year about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why does it take so long to write these books? Is it just, is it the refining you were talking about? Or is it just that, you know, a lot of things aren't going to work and are going to have to come back and be fixed. But I have, again, being completely inexperienced, yeah. I'm always amazed at how long it takes, given how much we all write emails and create stuff on a daily basis. I'm always amazed at how long it takes to write books, even though I'm sure that's the case. Yeah, and I mean, a book a year is is it's a pretty prolific, but that's yeah. that's what's expected for a commercial author. So, yeah. yeah, you spent a month outlining, you spend four months writing a super rough draft, you kind of lift up on that and then come back to it, and hopefully it works, and then you spend two or three months getting that into like clean copy so it looks like a book and then you read it again and then you rework and polish that um and that's yeah that's that's a year if it all goes well and then sometimes you know halfway through you'll have this happened to me like the whole thing is about a guy's daughter who's kidnapped and then at the end 
you know, you find out she's alive and you, you write it and you're like emotional as you write it. And then you give it to, you give it to your readers. And they said, it really fell flat to me. Oh, it's totally subjective. Like, I don't think any of that worked. So then you need to go back and do major surgery on your book. And that's why it takes a year or sometimes longer and you're up against deadlines because you're doing, you know, all these like kind of quality assurance steps. Um, are there stories of folks who write like a book in a month and it's done? Like, are those, do those oh, happen yeah. ever like where it just someone had the idea and just dove in and it was great? Yeah. I mean, Kerouac wrote that in two weeks on the road and um, Philip K. Dick, who's written like the stories that became every sci-fi movie you've ever seen. He was, he would write a book in two weeks and you can tell because he'd be like, this girl came in wearing some kind of crazy outfit. And you know, it was just like, he Ooh, was, that's, on, I like that. That's he was on style. methamphetamine. Which not my style helps. yeah um and uh, what's really funny about it is how much of it is um kind of like psychological getting yourself into the, into the moment because to actually write a thousand words you can do that in an hour or an hour and a half if if you know what you're going to say but you have to figure out this whole world and it has to make sense and be surprising. So that's the hard part. The hard part is thinking it through and, you know, making it all make sense and conceiving of this entire world that will be internally consistent, surprising to people, compelling enough that people want to read it. Cause basically you're asking people to, you know, sit down and read 350 pages out of your head uh, and, you know, to just pay attention to you for eight hours and, 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 and to pay good money for that. So it's hard to make something that's that compelling. I think that's where wow. the, the difficulty comes in. All right. So six months have gone by a couple drafts. King Pawn, the gorilla chess thriller is a, a, a manuscript is done. Mm -hmm. Now what? Now, you give it to all your friends and family and help have them tear it apart. Okay. Um, and then do another revision. If you want to get it published, you get it into super duper good shape until you can't possibly improve it in any way you can conceive of, which often means putting it down and walking away for a while. And then you go through, and then there's a whole other world of trying to get it published. Um, well, we need to figure that out because, oh, and the title just came to me. Check primate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna keep going after yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. I'm here. It's ready. Here it's polished. You. Everyone loved it. It was. It was universally acclaimed. Yeah. So I mean, actually getting something published is a, a weird art that no one knows about because it's very specialized. But everybody who wants to get something published has to like learn this, and it's it's pretty formal. Um, you read a query which is a one paragraph, almost cover letter to an agent. You also need to usually shake your network for any agent, you know, because a referral is the best way to get attention because they're just inundated with stuff. And I would see this, I would see something similar to this at the Atlantic because the Atlantic would get 10,000 submissions a year. 10,000? Yeah, and they just go in, it's called a slush pile. And it's literally a pile of manuscripts. I'm sure it's digital now. And they would have the interns go in there and just read through it and be like, well, what do you think of this? You know, and we, we didn't know anything. And uh, people come out of the slush pile. Um, what was it? Really famous books have come out of the slush pile. At the Atlantic, um, William Longavisha, I think, came out of the slush pile or just came from an unsolicited manuscript. And um, boy, there was a book a super famous, one of the super famous YA billion dollar franchises came out of the slush pile at my agency, Writer's House, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so Hunger Games, was it? Uh... I, you know, I can't remember. And, or it was something where I, I, it was, it was a, just a submission and the, and the, the agent who found it and said, this is gonna be good from a totally unknown person. It, I think it it was huge for their career. Um, 
good to know they read. I mean, that's kind of encouraging that they read that, right? That there's yeah, there's a slush pile. So someone, some intern somewhere will read your stuff. Yeah, and it's really funny because from the outside, it looks like this impossibly high fortress um, because these literary, literary agents are getting thousands and thousands of submissions. And but what's funny is that they're dying to say yes to something awesome. It's and it's it's funny how hard it is to get a good book. Um, so they're they're looking for the next thing. And and debut fiction is sort of very hot because people a debut author has no track record and often will get a lot of excitement and, um, you know, can can make a lot of money. Um, and so they're going through all of these. And this is I mean, this goes back to why you should have such a strong premise for your book is ultimately when you come back around to trying to get published, you're going to be sending like a paragraph to agents and they'll decide whether or not to read it based on that paragraph. And then the dance goes, you know, you wait a month or two and then they might request like an opening chunk of it and then you send that and then you wait a month or two and then they might request the full manuscript and then you wait a month or two and then they might decide to represent you. And so I had like, I had nine or 10 at least people, people reject my first manuscript and then one said, I'll work with you on the next one, sort of like nothing too formal. Um, and so I put the first manuscript aside and did a second book with him. Is that the one that became the 500? Yeah. So you just need to be prepared to, you make a list and you try to take your, um, you know, your ego out of it as much as possible because everybody gets rejected dozens of times and you just, this person rejects you, you go to the next one or you do it, you know, at the same so time. So Grisham's agent who encouraged you to keep going to end up not liking the manuscript? Yeah. Like, hey, thanks. I, I did this because of you six months ago, right? You could yeah, have helped that, me out. That wouldn't have worked. And it wasn't a good book. Hmm. So I'm glad they said no because I would have come out with like a uh, debut. Were you devastated when you sent that out after all that work and it was rejected? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I've been eating spaghetti for a year and it just like. How do you. How do you, you just do the next one? Yeah. How do you bounce back from that? Well, I was like. 28. No, but it's a lot of work and emotion into a book. Yeah, you just keep going. I really loved it, you know, and it's I and this is why when writers come to me, I say, you know, you really have to be passionate about it. I early on now that I'm older, I don't know that I would think this way, but I said, I love doing this so much. I would do this if I had to, like, work in a coffee shop and do anything just to pay the bills just to do this, even if it never comes together. Hmm. That's how much I enjoy this. So, I mean, like that's kind of, if that's your outlook, everything's upside. Wow. Man. So, Check Primate has now been picked up by an agent and uh, a book deal's been signed. Well, no. No? No, the agent gets it in good shape. The agent knows all the publishers and shops it around. Really, right? yeah. But that, I mean, that's the whole thing. So they shop it around to the publishers, and hopefully somebody wants to buy it. Maybe they don't. And you know, if you're really lucky, there's like a feeding frenzy, and there's an auction, and then there's an auction for TV film too. So I mean, at the that's, same time, too. Yeah, it can be at the same time if you kind of do wow. it right. Yeah. Now, is this you mentioned you have a cool story with your publisher or a hall? You said a hallmark story of sorts. Is this? Well, I, that's kind of just the story of this all coming together right before um, the wedding and all working out. That was kind of when we were having a little conversation earlier. Yeah. The fact that I'd given myself a certain amount of time and um, and it, it worked out so well in my first book. You know, that was, it was, I was just incredibly fortunate. That's so cool. Do you remember where you were when you got the call that uh, a publisher want, or the offer you were going to take? Yeah, it was, it was sort of a funny 
setup because I was I was broke and I had also wrecked my knee in a skiing accident and so I had like I tore all the ligaments in my knee and I couldn't walk for a year and so I was going to like physical therapy on the bus in DC which was awful cuz like I you know people would jostle your knee and um and I was at the physical therapy office in the hallway when I got like the first offer and then I th I was on the bus ride home when the final offer came in and uh and I think I just did it like on the street in front of my apartment and then walked into my wife and, and told her what had happened. And, you know, I was I was really fortunate with that first deal. And I just walked in and told her the thing. And I mean, we couldn't believe it. And then I was at a party with colleagues from the Atlantic after I had left when the film deal came in. So I said, like, oh, excuse me for a second. And I crutched upstairs. And then I found out we had, we had optioned it to Fox. So it was like, I, I sometimes think, or this is like a, a joke I say, that I've imagined all this and I'm just somewhere completely delusional. And because I was, I was so lucky for it to come together like that. That's so cool. Man, what a day. Good day. It was a good day. You probably didn't have spaghetti that night. I had Chipotle. Which was a treat. That was like my favorite thing. Sponsorship opportunity. Yeah, it could be. Great moments require. I had, and I had Chipotle before we got and on it was, the bus. And it was, it was kind of like to... Double meat? No. God, I'd be in a coma. The, <laughs> the, it, was, it was kind of to stay grounded. Because there, there's a whole different head game that comes on from, su from suddenly being like the hot debut that year and, and having pressure and stuff like that. Because you go from practicing as an amateur forever, and then they're like, you're just going to do this at a high level professionally every year from now on. So do they sign you to a, is it, so when they get your book, et cetera, do you immediately start negotiating, hey, we want you to write another book, and do you get a deal to do future books? or do Yeah, you usually, I mean, it all depends, but I had a two-book deal, which is probably pretty typical for a debut author. Okay. Um, and, yeah, the funniest thing was I had an older kind of mentor figure, um, Alan Apple, he's the best. And he, he told me that it's not the second book that really screws you up, it's the third book. Because, I mean, there's so much pressure on you at that, like a lot of people lose their minds over the second book. Um, and I said, well, great, no, it's the third book. And actually the second book turned out to be a hellacious experience and I needed to rework it a lot. And I went to him and I said, man, what's the deal? He told me it was the third book. He's like, I just tell everybody that <laughs> so they can chill out a little bit. But yeah, the second book is a nightmare. And it was so your second book was hellacious. Yeah. Yeah. Was it pressure? Was it like, oh, my gosh, you know, I've done this once. How am I going to do this again? I think it was probably suddenly like I had gotten everything I had hoped for and I wasn't like as hungry. I wasn't taking anything for granted, but I just wrote a book that was like all these crazy ideas that were overstuffed into one thing. I didn't have that like hungry discipline of, I'm trying to break in with this one book. This thing needs to be like a lean, clean machine. Mm. I wish, didn't plan on rhyming those. Um, with like a super clean plot. You know, I, I, the pressure was off, so I just like I just had fun with it, and I ended up probably indulging some bad habits of my own. So you're like Rocky after his victory over Apollo Creed, and then loses to Mr. T because he gets complacent. Is that, what happens? Is he not that is what happens enough? if you haven't seen. Oh yeah, you should. Yeah. You, that's where he goes. You got to get back the eye of the tiger, man. Oh okay. You lost it. The whole yeah. beginning of the movie is him like instead of training like you know punching a he's raw even, meat, he's yeah. like taking photo ops and. Oh yeah 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 yeah. I mean I always like treated everything as a windfall and um you know just hoped i could write the next book hmm. and uh yeah so i wasn't I, I vaguely remember those scenes yeah so i i always took it for granted but it was just something with 
the pressure being off. I, I think I, I indulge some bad habits on the second book, and, then that, and that can be a cycle, you know? You, you realize how hard this is every so often, and you're super hardcore about that next book, and you're super hard on yourself for it, and then that book turns out to be awesome. And then the next book, you kind of forget how hard it is to thread the needle of everything it takes to make a really good book. And, um, and sometimes your bad habits creep in and, and the next one needs more work. Hmm. Do you, uh, do you listen to music while you write or is it all silence? Oh, it's all silence. And I'm like a crazy person. Really? I'm not as crazy as some people, but I wear earplugs. And then my wife and I have both worked from home pre COVID for eight years. And we did it in a one bedroom apartment in DC. Wow. And I joke with people about like the shining, <laughs> you know, the shining, he's like oh, an ax murderer. And there's a funny scene where she comes down to do something very sweet to him. And he's like, can you mess this all up? And he freaks out on her. And my joke about writers is we watch the shining and we're like, I, I, I she shouldn't have come in. He had a groove going, you know, all work and no play makes Jack a dull yeah. boy. So yeah, I wear earplugs and then um, sometimes I'll wear noise canceling headphones over the earplugs. And if you're ever in a situation where you really need to concentrate and there's a lot of outside noise, somebody could be doing target practice next to your head and that will get it done. Actually, if you put some white noise through the noise canceling headphones over the earplugs, you can concentrate no matter what. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Another sponsorship opportunity. It's just a Bose little, Quiet Comfort. Yeah, a little lens into how how strange the authors get. How long a stretches do you write for? So, I mean, not not much more than like forty five minutes at a time. Okay, really? Yeah, and this is this is like a big thing um, that I've, I've worked out over the last three years. And if I can just sort of go off on like how to plan your day, if Please. you know, I'm getting into like craft advice, I used to be totally like, I started writing completely nocturnal because there's no distractions. You do it at night. And then I would do that in my career. And it was crazy because I would basically like, I would do something during the day and a lot of the day was actually just sort of like trying to get my head up to write and I could never do it until the evening. And then I would, you know, start around five or six and then I would write till, or sometimes I'd start later than that. And then I would write till midnight one or two. And I, I like, I had no life and my free time was weird during the day, procrastination time. So it was, it wasn't good. Um, and then over the past few years, I've started just keeping much more regular hours and keeping a word count. And, a lot, you know, it's, it's really surprising how much of writing is figuring out this, this discipline piece where you have a word count for a certain day and you just sit down. And for me, it really it was shocking how much having a way to absolutely turn off the internet, like transform my work because I would sit down, I would turn off the internet on everything for 45 minutes. And then I would, I would write and I would actually get my work done during the day. And then at five or six o'clock I could stop. And it was, it was so nice. It was a total revelation to sort of be on the same schedule as my wife and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, the, the, the whole thing about resistance and procrastination and a lot of it's tied up with anxiety about making sure you do a good job is, I mean, that's, that's really most of the game. So, you know, I'll, I'll sit down and write and in 45 minutes or an hour, I can write a thousand words, which is really all you need to write a day. So if I have two or three of those sessions a day, I've, I've hit like a huge word count. You know, so the day goes so three 45 minute sessions a day. Yeah. I mean, you can write enough. That seems utterly manageable for a flexible work from home. Yeah, schedule. totally. But the thing is, you need to spend a lot of this. There's just an extraordinary amount of time thinking. 
Got it. Oh, so that's 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 just the riding group, but the rest of the day is other work day is spent walking, ideating, digging yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's a whole figuring out your story. Let's say you figured out your story, but the, it's it's a similar pattern. You know, you walk around your neighborhood for or park for like 45 minutes. Like, what happens next? You know, what if they go back and that guy turns out to be the bad guy? Oh, he can't be the bad guy. Remember, he would have we would have. You would have done something differently at the beginning of the book that won't work and it's just you in your head like that and then that's figuring out the story and then when you're figuring out the when you have the story figured out and you're writing a particular scene you kind of know what's going to happen next in the scene like oh they're gonna the cia security people are going to come for them but they'll barely get away so that's your brief for the day and then you walk around the neighborhood and you say, well, what does that look like? And then you figure it out and, you know, it won't work and it finally works. And then you take a shower and it all comes together in the shower. And then for me, I just do a voice note. And then um, I have a thing that actually transcribes a voice note. Cool. Um, and then, then you sit down once you've actually pictured that scene and then you write it up. So that write up takes 45 minutes. But the actual figuring that out has taken like a lot of brainstorming time going into it. Wow. I had several book ideas during this interview. I have it, to go write them down. Write them down. No, yeah. And one of them is not about primates playing chess. Yeah, because that's mine. I know, you did. Yeah. You said so. yeah. copyright. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you think that the texting, the email, the way we communicate with such sort of flippancy and brevity now, and then even spell hmm. things like spell check, does that, in the same way reading books, like primes you for story, do you feel that all the texting, tweeting, social media, et cetera, actually rewires you in the wrong way against long form writing, et cetera? I have this personal yeah. theory just that my writing is actually uh, devolved um, since like probably high school, early college when I was reading a lot more due to the amount of my mind's pulled in so many different ways now, you know, consulting different projects and then also just just the amount of time that's spent creating 140, you know, character messages. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, it's funny when I look at like email, I used to have like correspondences with people. I think this is sort of a general trend too. You know, I mm -hmm. used to have like correspondence, but I was young and like didn't have as much to do, you know? Um, <laughs> and, but as far as like, I really feel my adult internet addicted brain when I sit down to read a book because I'll sit down to read and then I'll want to check or futz with something. And so it's really hard. And when I sit down to write, it's like, it's really hard. Um, and I actually need to buy this app, which is great, which blocks the internet. And I'll still try to check things. <laughs> and it'll pop up a thing saying you can't do that. And I'm like, of course, I don't want to do that because I want to work. And then I'll try. So to it's almost it it's mindlessly robotic. You're just like it's it's at this reptile slot machine. Oh, and it's really fat because and it's it's such a fascinating thing, because especially if you are nervous, like the more anxious you are about the next project or pressure you feel, the more procrastination there is. And um, because you're scared to sort of step onto that stage because you might fail. And so it, it, it would shock and appall you how much writers procrastinate. You like even the good ones, you know, like John McPhee, who's this famous nonfiction New Yorker guy. You know, he, I was reading his, he's been writing all these memoirs and he's like, some days like you really don't start writing until five o'clock and that's just the deal, you know? Um, because you've been like procrastinating and, and wow. it's, it's shocking like how strong the compulsion to do something else is when you when you should be sitting in that chair that only comes up when you sit down right like do you like when you sit down to write and you have suddenly a compulsion like oh my god i need to go oh, i need to do we this. need eggs we or, have to go or, get eggs you know before you sit down to write you're like you know i need to learn more about cyprus what's up with that Cyprus. I mean, it's Turkey. Is it Greece? I don't even know. I'll write about Cyprus more. Today I'm yeah. going to learn about Cyprus. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll sit down for an hour with that. Yeah. And, and it's, 
Wow. And, and it's it's been really kind of sobering for me to realize that like as a smart, willful, disciplined person, I am completely at the whim of these procrastination things and I need to like physically turn off the internet. And what a dramatic change that made for me. It was shocking. So the moral of the story is if you only watch 30 seconds of this interview, it's turn off the internet after you've downloaded and you can stream this offline after yeah. you've downloaded, this, not yeah. during, because then you won't be able to finish the interview. It's turn off the internet and figure your stuff out while you take a walk. As soon as you've subscribed and watched this, turn off the internet. Yeah, That's can right. I do the thing where I'm like, go ahead and smash that like button? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ding. Um, what was it like? You mentioned earlier, it, it's, a, it's a pretty, intimate and fun community of writers because you all share the the same you know struggles and highs and lows but what was it like when you got to meet folks like michael Connolly or some of the other thriller writers um yeah how does that happen is it does your publisher put you all in touch or how does it how do you or you just meet them through appearances how does that work it's well there's an incredibly cool crime writing scene and their their conferences and they're incredibly supportive and I, I really can't think of anybody who's like a jerk, you know? Hmm. I mean, especially like the established, obviously you have a conference with 3000 people, there's gonna be like somebody where you're like, well, that guy's a little weird. But the, there's this really cool pay it forward ethos, which is incredible and um, it's a really nice community and it's and the joke is that like everyone's spending all day murdering people in their minds and like <laughs> doing all this diabolical stuff and then they get together and they just want to you know party maybe it's because it's such a weird job and people tend to be sort of geographically scattered so you only see each other at these conferences once a year but you know you have these they're like camp friends, you know, you see them at the conferences and you're super tight for four days and then you don't see them till next year. Um, but it's, it's a really cool community. And it's funny because, um, you know, you hear some other communities like people are a little bit, there's much more cliquish and nasty and all this crazy stuff. And it's like a nest of, nest of vipers and I mean, there's a funny thing like the Romance Writers of America meeting apparently is like super high drama and everybody has crazy. Really? Out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so but the crime writers are a bunch of sweethearts and, and everybody's been really, like really nice to me. And, um, you know, like the I got quotes from David Baldacci and Michael Connolly for a couple books and I got them by just like writing them a nice note saying that I love their stuff and asking, you know, if I could send a book to them because I'd be honored if they read it and if they liked it. Um, and, and they said, yeah, cause it's, it's just a really cool crowd. That's awesome. Do you, when you read other work, how are you with envy versus appreciation? Do you, mm -hmm. do you read people's stuff and go, man, that's so cool. Or do you have those moments where you're like, oh man, like I wish I could have written that or. Yeah. I mean, what's funny is that Everyone's super nice to each other, but all of us writers are like mad with envy at all time. And, <laughs> and it's really funny. And it, everybody's like genuinely happy for each other, but also like, why didn't it happen to me? Um, and, and one of the most interesting and sort of valuable things for me is, you know, there are times when say you need to like rework a book and you're like stressed out and it's a nightmare. and what, what I found really cool was when that happened, I reached out to some people and, and everybody had been through it and everybody was really supportive. And, you know, especially today where everything's on social media, trumpeting, you don't go on social, I mean, some people do, but typically you don't go on social media to be like, I feel like a failure today. Uh, I didn't get any writing done. I spent all day like, putzing around on the internet. So it was, it was really valuable to kind of talk to people and to realize like everybody goes through these and these hard patches and everybody struggles with this stuff. Um, and so that, that was like a neat 
a neat lesson because the people whose whose career seemed perfect or um you know every book seemed charmed they talked about like dude i've been through the ringer too and it was really hard and i know what you're going through and that's just it's really reassuring because you know, so many people put out only the wins you know and everyone seems to have kind of these these perfect personas everyone has a second book right yeah yeah every, oh everyone has a second. and then you know you talk to people and then you're like wow that was even worse than what i went through and you know um so it was it was a really it was a really interesting experience and valuable and uh, you know kind of opening up like that it's cool because everybody goes through that and you connect more deeply with people. And I'm just, I've been really lucky that there's such a cool mm. prime and thrower community that you can do that. Now I have to ask you as far as once a book is out there and the publisher's putting out there and you know, and I know that's, it's hard because sometimes, sometimes you have an idea long before it becomes randomly culturally re relevant mm -hmm. and you appear to be quite prescient, you know, in the, example in one of your books um you know who would have thought the idea of russian influence at the highest levels of government mm. would be you know something would be in our daily news and that must have helped you know the book become more popular well but, that yeah so the, i mean the tricky thing is that it takes a year to write the book you hand it in it takes a year to publish the book so even if you're prescient the thing you were predicting can happen before the book comes out, even if you're ahead of the game. So with that book, The Night Agent, which is sort of about Russian, um, Russia interfering in our politics, it, you know, I was writing it when that wasn't front page news and was sort of a, a speculative notion and kind of under the radar and then I was almost done with the book and then it really started hitting in a huge way um, with all these questions around Trump and and I was like, oh good, but also no, because if I write a plot where the president is some Manchurian candidate for Russia, people are like, yeah, I mean, that's the what all these headlines are about. So I knew I had this lead time and I, it actually worked out for the best. I mean, there was a moment where I was, you know, just white knuckling it and was like, oh no, this book isn't gonna work. Uh, news has gotten ahead of us, but it, it forced me to add some twists and kind of riff off what was happening in the news. And I think made it a much stronger and more surprising book in the end. Do you think, so how do you think books become bestsellers in a sense do you think is it word of mouth or i was talking about this with a friend the other day i don't know how you know obviously the publisher ha you know can help you with marketing etc but what what do you think what variables go into if a book catches on and becomes a uh, very popular in the fiction in the fiction world well i mean it's all art well you're a marketer you sort of know that's um, why i'm trying to figure it out yeah. so i can sell this later as yeah, an e -course, yeah you know um well i, I I, that's not really my area of expertise, but just having been having kind of seen the magic that the publishers can do sometimes it's a lot of it is just, you know, the publishers will um, really get excited for about a book. And I mean, this is why I tell people that their book has to be so strong when they first get an agent because you need to be excited enough about a book that an agent gets excited that a that he can get a publisher excited, that she can get the marketing team excited, that they can get the sales team excited, that they can get the buyers from, you know, uh, the indie bookstores and Costco. And it's just this, you know, you need to have so much excitement around this book that you can filter it out into the world. And that's kind of how it works. And, you know, the publishers will put really big campaigns behind something and that will sort of signal their enthusiasm for a book and you know they can only do that with so many books a year and that kind of signals it to the the marketing and sales teams and that signals it to the the buyers for these different bookstores and 
I think that's where you're sort of that sort of make them, makes or breaks a book because they'll those bookstores will buy a certain amount and that's how many they'll print and you can't have a bestseller if they only print 5,000 books um, but you know if they have enough orders and print a hundred thousand books you can have a bestseller um, so it's it's a big machine and it's it's a really cool community because the people working at the publishers are they're all book people and they're wonderful and most I mean most everybody doing it is doing it because they love books and the same thing on the bookstore side um, so that's kind of typically how it's done it's um, this kind of these different groups and marketing and the relationships between the booksellers and the publishers. And there's another thing that can happen, which is this bottom up phenomenon where something just takes off and, you know, um, like where the crawdads sing was this incredibly yeah. huge book and nobody, I haven't read it. Um, nobody would look at that book and be like, oh, this is going to sell like hotcakes. It wasn't like Jaws, you know? Yeah. And it just takes off by word of mouth. So there's this other cool, yeah, random cream rises to the top thing happening too that no one can predict. Yeah. That's cool. I love it when things happen like that still. It's cool to hear stories like that. Yeah. Well, as the, uh, as the moon will start to set here and we get to the early hours of the morning in our campsite, um, like to muse a little deeper before we wrap up here. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, you have a very supportive spouse. Let me ask you, how important is it if you're going to be a creative or a writer and someone to have someone who, you know, gets that and is on board that that has to present unique challenges in a in a marriage for, or I guess for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean it's been really important to me, um, and I've been really fortunate. And then. And the, I mean, the really fun thing about my, my wife, I, I always mention this because, I mean, she was there to say, like, you're going to pursue this dream. Who cares about, you know, don't worry about the practical stuff for a while, um, which I mean, that's so amazing because who says know, that? That's awesome. I know. Um, just really lucky. And, you know, if, if I had been with somebody who was just like novels. And every day I was poking their head in to be like, you could look for another job, you know? Um, I don't know how it would have gone because I'm, I'm a very practical person. So this was at the edge of my comfort zone. Um, and then, and, and my wife, Heather, she's amazing. Cause also I like to talk through these things. So I'll do a plot talk with her. And we'll be walking and I'll be like, okay, so he jumps out of the van and then the guy comes through the woods and you just like talk through the story and it's great. Or, you know, she'll read stuff and I'll be like, didn't that break your heart? And she'll be like, you're going to end with the sappy scene between these two. Like she almost betrayed him and she totally saved me on the last book. And she, um, we act out fight scenes around the house. Is this cathar? Is this also sort of therapeutic? I think so. It, it's fun. <laughs> um, she's very athletic, so you know. Careful which fight scenes. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's actually hard to block out a fight scene just sitting in your chair, because you'll have this scene where somebody grabs a knife and then grabs the gun and then grabs the guy's throat, and somebody's reading it and be like, "How many hands does this guy have?" Next plot twist. Yeah, and so <laughs> it, and it's a fun break from just sitting in the chair like grinding all day. Be like, hon, I'll meet you in the living room. You have a knife. I have the detonator. And, and you sort of act out the fight scene. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's great. And then the other piece that we talked about a little earlier is, um, you know, if your job is your passion, it can be a little dangerous. Because writing was my passion. It was like all I would do, all I wanted to do. And then it's really easy to let it take over your whole life. And so you need to be conscious and to, you know, set boundaries. And that's something I've kind of worked on for the last few years to try to treat it more like a normal job. And writing is, um, 
you know, it's it's tricky in that there's different expectations mm -hmm. um, because like people are totally fine with writers being completely crazy and unreasonable. It's like expected that you'll be a crazy person a little bit, um, but you don't you don't want to be a crazy person. So I try to be as as workmanlike and and set boundaries around it um, just to have that balance in life. I have to ask, um, because again, you convinced this amazing woman who knife fights with you, mm -hmm. you know, and the couple of the knife fights together stays together. So it's been said. How did you convince this person to marry you while you were just having spaghetti and writing? This is awesome. I mean, how did you meet your wife and what's your story there? Uh, well, we met in DC um, through friends of friends. We, everybody was like a journalist or working at a nonprofit. Um, so it was cool. Everybody's into ideas and I had a little corner store next to my apartment and that's how I found the apartment. I drove down from D from New Jersey with all my worldly goods, like the clampets on top of my Jeep. And I got a great sandwich at this place and I saw some like cute girl walking by. This is when I was first moving to DC and I was like, I'll move here, this neighborhood's great. And I moved across the street. And uh, practical, would, I like yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> we would have, we called it drink and think. And um, because this, nobody really had any money and this, corner store they would just sell you a six pack and you would just sit on their cafe tables and drink it so you know all the nonprofit people and the journalists making no money could could sit out there and you know have a night out for for nothing and so i met her through that and um yeah i don't know how i convinced her to marry me um but it was you know it's 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 been a wonderful thing and it, it's a fun story because when i first met her she was about to move to paris for three months right before we got together and then i was like oh no i met i met my dream partner and she's she's moving to paris and we had you know only gone on a few dates and i was like is this it because she had planned to move to india after that to work and wow nonprofits there and uh, you know i was trying to be cool <laughs> and i was like so maybe i can see you in paris you know she said i think she said you better and so like our fourth or fifth date i met her in paris and stayed with her for two weeks there and we went to crete you flew to paris and, yeah this was, is while on the spaghetti budget this was no this was early this was when we first started dating um but yeah nobody had any money then either because paris um, ain't cheap to get to yeah but like we had friends and uh you know yeah you can there's like you find a way you know bohemian paris is fun okay you know staying in like a weird old mansard hotel or crashing on a friend's floor yeah it's fun. fourth date to appear that's a that's yeah that's commitment yeah and it was like we don't really know each other and i guess we're just gonna you know i'm gonna fly across the world to stay with you for a couple of weeks and it worked out here we are would you say when you know you know yes yes okay with this with this one i knew you knew she was more than just a premise. She was also a plot. Yes. Trying to bring that back. Yes. You know. Yes. And she's still she's got a lot of twists left. Oh, there you go. I like that. Like we can get very literary. Uh, tradition on the show. We also we close with uh, asking the uh, the married men, what's something you should say to your spouse that you don't say enough? You know, I forgot to brainstorm this when you gave you know me my cheat sheet. Sorry, writer. No, yeah. uh, no, no ideation. No walk around the block. Just from the heart. Think about this. You know, like a a true, I'm sorry, with no defensiveness. Hmm. And I mean, it's probably not like the most romantic answer, but uh, practical. You know, like, and it's not really about saving your skin, but just I found it so valuable in a relationship to to really th to be willing to kind of think about whether you did something right or wrong without instantly being defensive mm. and, and, and to admit when you're wrong. I found that to be like really a, a hard, a hard thing to do to get rid of the defensiveness when, you know, somebody something frictiony comes up but uh yeah i think that's that's a valuable lesson i've picked up over the last few years that's awesome well before i do my final closing spiel uh anything you want to talk about we missed or want to plug or just feel the burden to share with the universe 
I guess I should plug. This is the latest book. Yeah. Hour of the Assassin. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. I'll give. I'll queue you up for that, Book and then I'll. Everywhere. I'll. I'll. Yeah. I'll. I'll queue up for that. So. Well, alas, our time at the fire is drawing to a close here. But if you are by a campfire and you need something good to read, I was going to ask you, Matthew Gort, do you have any recs on a good book I could pick up for my next camping trip? Mm. Oh. Mark. Oh, well, look at that. Yeah. Oh, Hour of the Assassin right here. Wow. Yeah, sort of one of one of my more stripped down thrillers. It'd be good good for the tent read because it's just a bullet. What's the premise of this one? The premise of this, it's it's based on these real life people I ran across researching, but um, there are people who pose as assassins to test the security around high ranking government officials. Um, and so this is a former Secret Service agent who does that work. And, um, you know, he used to defend against assassinations and now he spends his day putting himself in the mind of an assassin. And he's doing a job, you know, seeing how somebody would get to the former CIA director. So he's sort of stalking him and, you know, playing assassin. And then he, um, you know, gets into his inner sanctum and he's there and then everything goes haywire. We're Ooh. off to the races. Cliffhanger. Yes. Fantastic. Well, that is absolutely amazing. Uh, pick it up. Available at fine book retailers everywhere. 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 That's right. Everywhere. We published it in UK today. Congratulations. Yeah. And if you go to any of these retailers and you enter promo code went camping, they won't know what you're talking about and you will still pay full price for it. But try it anyway and see what happens. Uh, this is awesome. Matthew Quirk, thank you for camping with me. Thank you. And go ahead and smash that like button. <laughs> <laughs> like it. Also, listen to this on podcasts. Listen to everything. Do it all right now before you unplug the internet. Thanks for joining us, folks. If you want to help us out, and we're confident you do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button here on our YouTube channel. And if you ever feel like just listening to these, you can check us out on all major podcast streaming platforms by just searching for I Went Camping With. And there, you should also subscribe. Thanks again, folks.